Yes, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, New South Wales AFI Education Night. Uh, my name is Michael Forbes. I am president of New South Wales Association of Fire Investigators. Investigators, and uh, thank you all for for coming. And uh, tonight, this is an online event, uh, and we try and have uh, five or six of these uh, each year. Uh, and it's around, I guess, informing and educating. Uh, fire investigators, but certainly other people in the forensics uh, um, industry about uh, different things happening, case studies, et cetera. So tonight we're uh, lucky to have uh, EV FireSafe present, um, uh, Emma Sutcliffe here from here and some of her team are here to give you a presentation on a recent incident that occurred last year and uh, a case study around that, which is uh, to do with an EV vehicle and they're a pretty rare event. Uh, haven't had many in this country, so to actually break one down and and have a look at it from a fire investigating perspective uh, is quite unique and um, very interesting because we haven't done it yet. Um, so uh, this is a good learnings for Australia, but uh, certainly um, uh, well, I'm very interested in uh, what they did and how they did it. So thank you, Emma. Over to you. <clears throat> Great. No worries. And that's on the screen, and everyone can hear me okay. Correct. Emma, just before yes. you start, uh, Ben yes. from the AFI team. Um, ladies and gents, uh, oh. we've just a little bit different event to what we're normally used to. We're not used to having so many people, as uh, Michael was just talking about. But uh, in terms of the, the way we're running tonight is uh, no one's um, got their cameras and mics uh, allowed just due to the amount of people we're expecting. We have okay. turned on the uh, question and answers. That's the Q&A uh, button, which is located up on the top or on the bottom where if on your device. Uh, you can ask your questions there, and if we have any sort of follow-up questions or any sort of discussions there, I'll ask you to raise your hand, and then I'll uh, approve the, the mic to allow a little bit more detail that can't be typed in a message. So um, if we can just uh, try and keep to that, um, ask your questions away through your questions and answers, and we'll get started. Thanks, Emma. Cool. No worries. Um, Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, uh, Mick. So, uh, Emma Sutcliffe, I'm the Director of EV FireSafe. Uh, I'm joined by Dan Fish, our Technical Specialist, and Glenn Probstall, our Automotive Specialist. Um, Nathan Smith, um, unfortunately, couldn't make it tonight, but he's the fourth member of the team uh, involved in this particular project, and I believe we've got a few more of the team uh, also on the call as well. So, EV FireSafe is an Australian company. We're funded, our, our research is funded by the Department of Defence to uh, look at electric vehicle battery fires and emergency response. Um, most of our team are also firefighters. Um, myself included and and uh, uh, both uh, Glenn and, and Dan. Um, last year, we uh, also moved into consulting um, and uh, some training as well. So uh, the part of what we've been doing with uh, this Tesla Teardown will actually form part of a, a training package. Uh, it'll be kind of the, the feature of the training package. Um, we also have um, other deep dive case studies on uh, various other vehicles, that kind of thing, which is not quite available yet, but hopefully in the next month or so. Um, EV FireSafe works globally. We work with a fantastic global network of, of agencies and uh, experts, and I'm sure a lot of you know Professor Paul Christensen's name. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work with Paul. Um, in, the, in our private consulting work now, we're doing a lot of work in the airport, uh, shipping, retail, um, uh, you know, various sectors. Um, and the, the hope is that by sharing uh, that knowledge with those sectors, we hopefully make firefighters' lives a bit easier by avoiding battery fires in the first place, but we'll see how that just goes. Just checking, just sorry to interrupt, Emma, just checking your slides are uh, moving. We're still on the initial slide. <laughs> okay. My internet's a little laggy. All right. Uh, no, I, you should be seeing slide four by now. Is that not working? How about that? No. There Do we you go. want to take yes. that over, Dan? No, 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 you've got it there. It's poking. So slide two, you can see now? Uh, <laughs> yes, there we go. We're moving through. Okay. Do you want to pick up the slides, Dan? Because I think my, sorry, everybody. This is always, a, there's always a technical glitch. Do you want to pick up the, share your screen, Dan, and we'll do it that way. I think your internet's probably going to be a bit more reliable than mine. All right. How's that going there? Yeah, perfect. So 
Yep. So that was uh, slide two, talking about what we do. Um, third slide, this is our the, the course I just mentioned that is not quite ready yet, but will be soon. Um, uh, and we can share some details with, about that later on. Uh, and then uh, if you move on one, the next slide talks about who we work with globally. Um, uh, that will probably one piece of uh, information here that will probably be of interest to many on the call is uh, I'm on the technical panel for the NFPAs. Um, they've got a two-year testing program uh, coming up. Uh, the, the main purpose of that testing program is to look at um, uh, emergency response to an electric vehicle battery fire uh, and the a part of uh, the, what the testing will look at is if we have two identical electric vehicles both with battery fires and we let one burn one bat pack burn out and we cool one which is actually going to be the most um, efficient way to manage uh, that particular incident um, so uh, as I said at the start we're funded by the Australian Department of Defence um, who are electrifying their fleet uh, like everybody is. And um, this is a very cool st Australian story. Um, this is a, a um, Bushmaster armoured personnel carrier um, that uh, was originally started life as a diesel vehicle. It was built down in Victoria and then converted to electric um, up in Newcastle and New South Wales. So this is one of the projects we've been working on for, for Army. Um, the core of what we do is actually we've built a, a database uh, and this is just a really quick look at what that looks like. So uh, we track global incidents. So we we look for uh, electric vehicle incidents. And when we say electric vehicle here, primarily um, uh, uh, cars, buses and trucks, anything on wheels, we put them into our database and then those learnings are um, published. We, we don't give access to the database itself, but a lot of what we learn is shared on our website at evfiresafe.com. So if you haven't had a look, please do jump on and have a, a sticky beak. So the core of what we do is uh, we look for battery fires and we've got two electric vehicles on fire on the screen right now. Um, but and if you move on one slide, Dan, uh, what we're looking for is was the high voltage lithium ion battery involved in what's called thermal runaway or battery fire? So the one on the left is clearly a battery fire. We can that, that vehicle is actually on its side. The, the fire department flipped it on its side so they could let it burn out and, and monitor it. The one on the right, as you can see, is fully involved in fire, but actually there was no battery involvement, believe it or not, in that particular incident. So what do the stats actually say? So um, as of today, we are sitting at, um, if you flick forward one, uh, 455 verified electric vehicle and electric car in, in, this, in this particular data set, electric vehicle uh, battery fires globally from 2010 to, to today. There are roughly 26 million on the road. 455 are the ones that we can verify actually went into thermal runaway. Uh, we won't have captured everything. It's uh, there's a number of reasons for that. The the primary one being where, you know, we we we're, we're bitten off more than we can chew. We want to do this globally. Well, we want to make sure uh, we're capturing as much as possible so we can learn as much as possible. Um, but also, uh, you know, it's 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 sometimes difficult to verify battery fire. Crews may not have the the right reporting um, pathway to to actually report these. And uh, so the the database, uh, as it stands at the moment, is is quite immature. And I really think that it's a really a two to five year. Uh, kind of process uh, before it's a really mature database. And we're just starting to set up um, data sharing agreements with various um, organisations and agencies and, and countries so we can kind of share that information more freely globally. So, um, yeah, that'll uh, improve over time. Um, here's what our database looks like, uh, battery fires year on year. And you can see here we had this kind of spike through 21 and 22. Um, now, primarily that was due to the two vehicles you can see on the screen. They had uh, batteries from LG Chem that actually had a fault during the manufacture. Uh, so we actually saw a little bit of a drop off last year, but these numbers are quite fluid. It's not uncommon for us to find an incident that maybe happened two or three years ago. And I'm not sure if our research Akira is on the call, but she's an absolute gun with this stuff. And um, as I say, occasionally we're mostly we're adding new incidents that maybe have uh, we've just found a fire report or an investigation report for. But occasionally we also take incidents off. We you know if if we if we've tracked it as a battery fire, but it turns out it wasn't, we'll we'll take that that uh, that 
um, start off the, the database. By manufacturer, it uh, looks something like this. And Tesla are right up the top there for a couple of reasons. The first is they're the most common electric vehicle on the road, the most popular. They also have instant torque. A lot of electric vehicles, you, you'll you hear people talk about this, this instant torque, very fast off the line. You're talking, we're starting to get into kind of racing car speeds in, in you know, family vehicles, essentially. So we do see a lot of, um, you know, battery fire caused by collision at speed, that kind of thing. Um, uh, the initial funding that we had from Defence was to determine how many electric vehicle battery fires occur while connected to charging and what additional layers of risk does that add for emergency responders. And there's a there's a whole kind of other presentation on, on, on that. Um, but roughly at the moment, uh, approximately 18% of our incidents on our database occur while the vehicle is connected to energised charging. Uh, the leading causes of battery fire in electric vehicles are they so where the cause is known, uh, the leading causes are uh, collision and road debris. Of course, road debris is uh, uh, the, the topic of discussion uh, tonight. Uh, submersion in water, uh, typically flood water, uh, particularly salty water, anything coastal. If the product's on recall, as you could see from the stats before, talking about the LG Chem batteries, which uh, of course led to a recall, or if the vehicle's been exposed to a, a, another fire, a, an external fire, such as a building or bush fire. And then another quick interesting point that I wanted to, to kind of share tonight is that, as you saw before, an EV fire doesn't necessarily mean EV battery fire. And we've known this for a long time, but it's only recently we've actually been had had data to kind of you know uh, quantify that, I guess. So in 2022, the Netherlands had 118 electric vehicles on fire but only 38%, so 45 of those, involved the high-voltage battery. So this is the first time that the, the team in the Netherlands at NIPV, we work with them very closely. They do an excellent job of, of really verifying and tracking their data. Um, so this has been a fantastic learning globally that we we, we need to train uh, emergency responders for. This is an EV on fire and this is an EV with a battery fire. And I've, I've got a couple of videos on that in a, in a bit as well. And just to kind of give you, um, uh, just to, to make the point as well, so if you move on one, Dan, um, electric vehicles can take, uh, packs can take enormous damage um, and, and not catch fire. I think there's a often a kind of a misconception that if an electric vehicle is in a, involved in an incident, um, we're going to have a fireball. But as you can see here, this is a pack that's exactly the same as the one we tore down. Um, and you can see the amount of damage here, and there was no uh, no thermal runaway in this in this particular case. And then just as a quick look for um, locally, uh, we, we're still at uh, six electric vehicle battery fires here in Australia, approximately 140, 150,000 electric vehicles on the road. We see them very often in salvage. We keep an eye on the salvage, uh, the, the sales, and we work closely with a, a, a major salvage company. Um, so we're seeing electric vehicles weekly going to salvage. They've been involved in collisions. They've been submerged, whatever it might be. But we're still sitting at six electric vehicle battery fires um, where the vehicle's been in normal operation. Um, and as you can see here, we've got arson. We've got three that were in uh, structures that burnt down. It wasn't the car that started the fire. You know, in, in one case, I believe we believe it was a lithium ion power tool, a battery from a power tool uh, that started the fire that led to that then spread to the car one high-speed collision, and then the, the last one that you see there on the screen is the road debris, which is our car we're talking about tonight. So we want to do a really quick look at thermal runaway, and, and some of you, um, I apologise if we're showing you stuff here that you already know, but when we talk about electric vehicle battery packs and thermal runaway fire, there's two really um, good concepts to understand to help us, under, you know, kind of really get our heads around it. So the first is how a battery pack is constructed. Oh, sorry, can you flick a flick over a slide for me. So an electric vehicle battery pack, this is a generic pack, but just to give you an idea, consists of multiple elect, um, lithium ion battery cells. Multiple cells go into a module and then multiple modules make a pack. And you can kind of see along this exploded view here, you've got uh, modules along each side and up the top there. The little box right at the top is the, the battery management system uh, up the, the top there. So that's the, the brains of the pack. It's telling it to charge up or cool down or whatever it might need to do. And what we have inside um, our particular car 
cylindrical cells. You can have cylindrical prismatic pouch. Uh, there's also the blade cell that BYD is um, uh, is, is also making. Um, but in our particular vehicle, we've got these uh, 2170 cylindrical cells. Now the pack sits underneath the vehicle uh, between the chassis rails. Now in some electric vehicles, it might be more in the boot. It you know, might be kind of a, a tunnel through the middle, but, you know, just as a general kind of rule of thumb, your pack sits down low underneath the vehicle, between the four wheels, between the chassis rails. And we've kind of got, we've we've got three uh, high voltage components or, or parts to an electric vehicle. We have our high voltage battery pack, our components, things like the drive motors, and then we have cables connecting everything up. And so anything coloured orange in an electric vehicle um, indicates a high voltage of 60 volts DC or above. Now, if anyone's an electrician or, you know, is used to kind of grid power, you 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 know that that's 60 volts is not high voltage in in that world but in the automotive world anything 60 volts dc and above is considered high voltage and is colored orange so if you're dealing with any vehicle that has any orange cables or stickers uh, those kinds of things that indicates you've got a high voltage battery somewhere in that vehicle um so thermal runaway uh, is the scientific term for battery fire. And this is what's happening. So we've got a little module here of, of our cells. So there's about 12 in this, this little module here. They're being deliberately overheated. And you may have seen this video, particularly if you're at the, I, the awesome IFE uh, event last week. So it's being deliberately overheated. The, as, it, as it's overheated, it, uh, the, the pressure builds up and the blast cap at the top of the cell bursts open. The electrolyte inside the cell vaporizes and becomes a, a vapor cloud, and that's highly toxic and highly flammable, so that ignites. Then the heat from that can't kind of dissipate anywhere but to the next cell. So the next cell does the same thing, then the heat from that goes to the next cell and so on. And we get this kind of chain reaction. Again, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this now. So as a really quick look at it, um, if you move on to the next slide, Dan, uh, roughly what's happening is this. We've got um, our battery cells in our module that are the modules in our pack, and one of them gets damaged in a, a collision or a piece of road debris hits it. It gets crushed. It short circuits, starts to heat up. Uh, at kind of the 50, 60 degree mark, you can maybe bring it back if you can cool it down. You can maybe bring it back from the edge. Once we reach that 170, 160, 170, you kind of, you, that's all over Red Rover. You're not really going to do much with it. It'll burst, the off gassing occurs, and then we get our, our ignition. So from an emergency responder perspective, that looks and sounds something like this. So loud gunshots, uh, popping noises, um, we get a vapour cloud, uh, we may start to see bits of cell debris projecting out from under the vehicle. Um, and from our research, what we found is the majority of the time we see ignition, in a very small number of cases, we get a vapour cloud explosion. I believe we're sitting at uh, 27 of our cases of our 455 that we, we saw before, 27 of those involved a vapor cloud explosion, but that's a that's a conversation for another time. So let's have a look at uh, Tesla, and it's not a typo. I had a lot of people email me, um, thank you for that, uh, saying you've spelt Tesla wrong. Um, no, we didn't. It's our it's our little take uh, on on our car, and if you flick over one slide, Dan. Uh, and the, the unfortunate thing is that now that we've named the car, we we feel very connected to it, and um, and and uh, it was quite a sad process <laughs> cutting it up and and pulling the pack out. But Tesla, so this is the vehicle uh, the the uh, that hit road debris near Goulburn last year that we tore down is a Tesla Model Three Long Range. So it, it's a dual motor, has motors front and rear full electric vehicle so full battery electric vehicle as i said before one of the most popular in the in the world and here in australia um curb weight of about 1800 kilos and battery weight of, of 550. now um the battery pack is again as we saw before is located down low between the chassis rails it runs at about 400 volts dc and if you flick over one more slide dan you can then also make out uh, sort of our front and rear motors and then that cable that goes up to the, the charge port at the rear of the car. So this is from the Tesla Emergency Response Guide. The battery cells, as I said before, are uh, what's called uh, 2170s, which is actually the size of them. So I can't remember which, so I think it's 21 mil 
diameter and 70 mil uh, height, cylindrical cells. In our Tesla, there were 4,416 individual lithium ion battery cells in four modules that run front to rear. And this is just a basic kind of anatomy of the, 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 the battery cell itself. Now, Teslas, this isn't our Tesla, this is another one, but Teslas have what's called a dropout pack. Now, Tesla Model 3 and Model Y, built from 2022 onwards. Is that right, Dan? 22 yes. onwards? Yep. Yeah, in Australia, uh, we're seeing in 2022 have what's called a dropout pack by design. So uh, here's, here's the time for another prop. Uh, the base plate is aluminium, which you can see there in the photo. Um, and when thermal runaway occurs, what happens is the base plate melts away. Uh, this is a, a piece from our Tesla at, at Goulburn that you can just hopefully see there on the, on the screen. Uh, it melts away and the cells essentially, that, that aluminium melts away and our cells actually drop out of the pack. And if you scroll on a, a slide, Dan, the, the purpose of this is to assist emergency responders to cool those cells down uh, uh, quickly. Now, this is a great case study um, from a couple of years ago uh, out of the US, and we had a long chat with the fire department that managed this incident. So again, it's a Tesla Model 3, same vehicle as, as we had. Um, and uh, it might not seem like it, but 42 minutes to manage an electric vehicle battery fire is actually quite a short amount of time. Uh, typically, our research indicates that that can take three to five hours to, to completely manage. And what you can see on the right there uh, are all, is basically all those battery cells that have fallen out into the ground. The idea of that is that uh, we can get water onto those cells and cool them down um, a bit quicker. So our Tesla, uh, Tesla, I should say, uh, actually hit a or, or ran over the top of uh, the tail shaft of a truck. It's an, a 17.9 kilo tail shaft uh, made of steel. Um, we the the post there that you can see down the bottom indicates that um, it was being carried um, in a trailer. Uh, and the car ran over the top of it. There were other cars that impacted with other smaller pieces of road debris. Um, someone's lost a load and, and um, our car has, has um, run over the top of it. Um, if you move on a slide, that led to thermal runaway in the battery pack. Uh, as you can see here, these um, apologies, I haven't put the image source on here, but this is taken by the Penrose Rural Fire Brigade um, uh, and taken used uh, from their Facebook page. If you move on one more, Dan. So just another image of, there we go, just another image of that incident there. So, uh, and if you move on one more, we yet to, we've we've requested um, a permission to uh, talk to Penrose Rural Fire Brigade. We're still waiting for, for approval on that so we can actually, um, you know, do a bit of a deep dive with those guys on uh, how much water, what was the, the incident duration, those kinds of things. So um, as soon as we've got that, we'll be able to add that to the mix. But currently we're not quite sure on all of those details. So um, that's um, that's something we're just waiting on at the moment. So if you move on to the next slide and play the video, this is a video taken by uh, Daniel Med uh, from Penrose Rural Fire Brigade. Um, oops. Here we go. And he can, oh, doesn't want to play. And as soon as we watched this video, our team could clearly see that this was thermal runaway. This was definitely a battery fire. You can see the amount of water that's being poured on to, do you, yeah, do you want to just play that again? Uh, play, play it again, Dan. I'm sure that's a line from a movie, isn't it? But sorry, I don't know why that's glitching like that. But you can see the amount of water being poured onto the, the vehicle itself. Um, and uh, there's a stubborn fire. It's not going out. It's down low uh, around the, the, the bottom of the vehicle where the battery pack sits. As I say, as soon as our team saw it, we knew exactly that that's thermal runaway. And just for comparison purposes, if you move on to the next slide, Dan, um, this is another Tesla fire uh, in uh, Vancouver. And you can see here the fire is up high. Uh, the firefighter is putting water on it and the flames are knocking down. Uh, so this is a EV on fire, not with battery involvement. Sorry, just trying to get All some right. uh, answers into the questions as well. Oh, cool. No worries. 
So this is how our Tesla ended up looking. And we often joke, Dan, Dan's been looking for a Tesla for quite a while. Uh, so this is his first company car. So because the vehicle was owned by Tesla Motors themselves, um, the, the team at APAC very, very kindly donated it to us, um, which was awesome. And then, uh, and if you move on a slide, Dan, you can just see, um, uh, just before we um, <laughs> then we kind of talked to them about how we removed the battery pack and they took pity on us and actually uh, organized for us to bring it out to their their workshop in Mulgrave in Melbourne uh, and and helped us actually take the battery pack out, which was like above and beyond. And we, we can't thank them enough because what we've learned from this uh, kind of process has been invaluable. So this was the first glimpse as we took it off the tow truck and got it up onto the hoist. Uh, and you can see there just a few of the scattered cells uh, where the, you know, the, the dropout pack is, is kind of burnt through. And um, we've got a good picture for you in a sec of the, um, uh, of the, where the, the, tear, the uh, tail shaft hit. So from the underside, um, the front of the vehicle being to the top and the rear at the bottom there, uh, we can see the two motors, uh, the the uh, orange high voltage, uh, orange section is where the high voltage pack is, our side our sills in yellow and our jacking points in, in green there. Uh, and if you move on one. And what we have is uh, the 4,416 battery cells, so our 2170s in four modules that run front to the front, run lengthways through the car. And if you move on a, a slide down, uh, and we numbered those one, one, one to four, as you can see there. Now our tail shaft actually uh, hit at the very top of, uh, kind of hit just in front of the battery pack at the top of module two, and the vehicle was traveling at 111 kilometers per hour at the time. And uh, uh, the amount of telemetry and data that Tesla were able to give us was, was incredible. So traveling at 111 kilometers per hour at the time, which cause the the obviously the tail shaft to kind of drag along the the, the ground we believe for about 100 meters uh, and tore open um that that module two almost to the end and if you move on to the next slide down that'll give everyone the the visual up on the hoist there so you can just see the point of impact just in the circle there and then it tore almost i, I believe we had what probably we had maybe 20 25 centimeters of of, of module kind of left towards the end there really it wasn't wasn't a lot yeah that's all we had in yeah so um of course what happened then as we know uh that led to thermal runaway so our reports uh you know kind of eyewitness reports are that it was slow to build somewhere between 10 and 12 minutes for the vehicle to kind of be become fully involved so it was quite a slow building fire um, initially, there was some loud popping noises. There were some gas clouds, again, very typical behavior for, for battery fire. Um, and then um, if you move on one slide, Dan, ignition occurred. We don't know, uh, and, and we see this kind of jet-like flame. So these are our gases escaping um, under pressure from the battery pack. The vehicle was at about 75% state of charge at the time of impact. Um, so it was a, a reasonably high state of charge. So we would have had a lot of um, the, the high the state of charge, the more energy, the more kind of uh, uh, gases we're going to get, the more um, fire behaviour we're going to get. Um, so a jet-like flame occurred. Uh, we're not sure which side of the vehicle it, it came from initially. That's um, We're still working that out, but that's indicative. So we're going to run through uh, just, there's just a bit of a happy snap of the team uh, just before we got stuck in. But uh, the pack, as you saw, was basically burnt out, completely damaged, uh, burnt out. I believe we maybe had, uh, what would you say, guys, 100 cells left that were still live. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of our 4,400. Obviously, some had been um, kind of left by the roadside or, or picked up by Toei, so we, we wouldn't have seen all, all 4,416 of them. But we really only had a, a few live cells left. It was uh, the, the, the pack was uh, largely destroyed. The occupant cabin, however, and if you want to flick through slowly just these, these images here, Dan, and feel free to jump in, guys, if you've got anything to add here. The occupant cabin was um, quite well preserved. It wasn't um, kind of, you know, there wasn't a lot of damage here. And when we eventually dropped the entire pack out, there was no, um, I guess, 
break or breach at the top of the pack into the occupant cabin. So any damage that we're seeing uh, was largely the flames licking up around the sides. Uh, windows, we believe, were, were broken by uh, attending crews to get water into the cabin. Airbags didn't deploy uh, with impact, um, and uh, but the pyrofuse, so the, the high voltage isolation, uh, the pyrofuse did blow, we believe, obviously, as a result of um, uh, the, the, the heat and, and damage. And then just... Um, yeah. Can I just jump in for a second? Dan, That's can fine. you go back three photos, please? So when M talks about the path of travel of the fire, no, one forward, please, Dan, for the, into the, yeah, thanks. So you'll see on the firewall, you'll see a, a rather large opening, which is almost square in shape. That's the inlet into the car from the car's air conditioning unit. The air conditioning ducting there is a um, polyethylene material. So the fire from the battery pack, as Emma said, it didn't breach the inside of the vehicle through the battery pack. You'll see some photos later on where the floor of the vehicle is still intact and in quite good condition. But as the battery pack went in the thermal runaway, the path of travel of the fire into the inside of the vehicle was up through the front of the vehicle where that arrow is that Dan's just highlighting and in through the air conditioning ducting into the dash. So when you have a look at the dash just behind uh, the LCD display there, you'll see some damage into the dash. That's the most area of damage on the dash that we identified, and that was the path to travel of fire. So that's how the fire got into the cabin of the car. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. And um, as you saw from the video before, a lot of that fire behaviour was down low where the battery pack sit. So this, again, is is often what we see is this kind of uh, damage around the wheels. And sorry, I should have said right from the very start of this presentation that I'm not a fire investigator. Um, uh, Glenn is. I know nothing about fire investigation. I, and and uh, everything we're talking about tonight is just a whole bunch of information that I'm hoping will be helpful to everybody on the call uh, and and. Uh, uh, I'm going to throw any technical questions directly to to Dan and and, and Glenn. So um, so yeah, we we quite often in the incidents that we investigate, we or, or we, that we track, we quite often see this kind of um, uh, damage around wheel arches. It's quite common for the the battery fires to kind of um, be quite um, active around uh, each of the wheel arches. I've just left it on this photo for a second as well, just to comment that the test of the Model Three and Model Y is designed with a vent at the rear of the battery pack um, that will vent out towards the rear tyres. The Model S and the Model X have vents and drains down the left and right hand sides of the pack, so you'll see different fire behaviour there. However, once you see a pack that's been compromised, such as um, structural damage being torn open like we had, the vent isn't really going to do much and it's going to vent out through those artificial openings. So just in here would be the vent area. And that's the uh, front uh, passenger side wheel, which uh, um, as front you can see, it was driver side. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to do the girl thing and turn it <laughs> uh, And then from the from the rear. So the damage to the boot here was actually. Um, uh, fire crews, we've, we've got some footage of them actually opening uh, using the, um, the uh, extrication tools to, to get access to the boot. Um, this water bottle was in the centre console of the vehicle and um, even we, we tore it. So the incident happened, I believe, on early September last year. We tore it down in early November and the water bottle and a, a, a reusable coffee cup were still in the centre console. And this was uh, how it, you know, how it was uh, following the fire uh, left in the car uh, until we we tore it down in November. So we, we kind of found it amazing that this water bottle was still, you know, it's a little bit kind of uh, bubbled there, but um, still intact, still had water in it. Um, uh, that was the, uh, the kind of, um, uh, I guess, occupant protection in, in that cabin area. So if you move on one, Dan, so um, Preby, you might like to talk to this one. This is just um, uh, showing that point of impact there. Yes, thanks, Em. So as Em showed you in her graphic earlier with the universal joint and the part of the tail shaft, the first point of impact 
after the front of the car ran over it was just in front of the battery pack. And then to the bottom of the circle, there's a, a little bit of a, a dint that's been removed. That was the point of impact we found on the universal joint. We were really fortunate that the universal joint was kindly put into the vehicle by somebody who'd seen the vehicle earlier, and it was retained with a piece of melted aluminium over the top. That piece of melted aluminium was part of the under tray of the battery pack, and we were able to utilise that, and you, you will see some photos uh, shortly that show exactly where the universal joint stopped in its path of travel. So we were able to effectively jigsaw puzzle the piece of metal together to come up with a location where this universal joint had stopped. But that's the initial point of impact that shows there's a, a fair bit of strength in that component of the car that a nearly 18 kilo lump of metal being hit at 111 kilometres an hour didn't actually tear through completely the front of the battery because the front structural element of the car is quite strong, but underneath the battery tray, given you've got the weight of the vehicle sitting on top and doing 111 kilometres an hour, you'll see in the next photos the actual path of travel that the Universal Joint took. And sorry, Proby, I think I'm going to make a liar of you. I don't believe I've included that photo of the uh, our little aluminium cap on the on the power shaft. I apologise. I'll find it while you guys are answering questions and put it up on the screen. But again, um, sorry, just go back one, Dan. Just uh, again, that um, uh, point of impact, path of travel, the front of the vehicles uh, to the top of the screen there. And if you look at if you look at that where that circle is. And you look that it goes underneath into what would be the engine compartment of an internal combustion engine vehicle, you can see the path of travel of the fire. So it went up in from underneath, in through that air conditioning uh, vent and then into the cabin of the vehicle. Mm. Um, now I'm going to, uh, I, I, sorry, I got to kind of the end of, of, of the, the kind of the photos and things and thought, what can we share with everybody to help keep everyone safer? Because obviously that's uh, a lot of uh, what we do at EV Fire Safe. So I wanted to talk briefly about the three main hazards that we were really aware of uh, while tearing down this vehicle. This is not our vehicle on the screen. This is another one. But um, I wanted to talk about the three main hazards. And again, Dan and, and Glenn, feel free to jump in at any time. But obviously, I guess this is a, an obvious one, breathing and personal protection from the products of combustion, the electrocution risk uh, with electric vehicles, and then the secondary ignition risk. So if you flick over a slide, Dan, um, we, um, uh, Dan uh, went out and, and um, made everybody, got, got complete sets for everybody of um, uh, personal protective gear, um, also high voltage gloves. I believe they were thousand volt gloves, Dan. Yeah, class O um, to the higher rated rather than some services just run the double O electrical gloves, um, as well as the uh, over gloves as well on those. Um, just noting as well that you may be responding to investigate incidents where we are dealing with these within a property. Um, what we are seeing is CO levels within properties, within rooms that did have doors closed However, when crews have gone through to check that structure for atmospheric uh, monitoring, seen um, elevated levels of carbon monoxide in those rooms and the doors were completely cold, uh, closed for the whole incident. So it's important to make sure, I'm sure you would be anyway as part of any other fire investigation, just to make sure your atmosphere is safe uh, before you're just relying on a dust mask and uh, particulate filters. Um, we were careful to, um, we had disposable wet wipes as well. We were careful to um, uh, clean down regularly um, and we changed everything over every few hours just to to keep ourselves as um, kind of uh, as clean as possible. As you can imagine, it was very, <laughs> very dirty work. Um, electrocution risk, uh, if you want to flick over a slide, Dan. So I'm going to let you talk to this one because this is your, um, this is your expertise. So... With a normally operating battery electric vehicle or hybrid, they're extremely safe, inherently safe, well designed, uh, with a lot of standards that go into the vehicles. What we are seeing, though, is that we're dealing with vehicles where these systems have been compromised. Where uh, Emma's talked about the pyrofuse in the Tesla, 
uh, it is uh, basically a um, self-destructing fuse with a, a pyro uh, detonator in that fuse as part of the metal bus bar of the battery pack. So with the Tesla uh, vehicles, if they sense a earth leakage fault, uh, if they sense a insulation fault or a isolation fault through those battery packs or the high voltage wiring, it should automatically detonate that pyro fuse. Same thing will happen in a high speed collision where the airbags have been deployed. So that is this one part of the electrical safety for a Tesla vehicle. What we also have is um, the shielding in these high voltage cabling is we have our standard, uh, say, thickness of our little finger of copper core that then has a layer of insulation around that. That then has a stainless steel braid and a uh, foil um, sheath around that as well. Then another layer of uh, the insulation material. The stainless steel braid uh, carries two functions. It's a bit of a cut abrasion uh, protection, so you can't simply cut through. But if that um, stainless steel braid does see any voltage change or resistance change, it's monitored by the battery management system and it should automatically open the contactors. In a normally operating vehicle, that there opening the contactors uh, eliminates the electrical circuits from outside the battery pack and the high voltage will remain just within the battery pack. We haven't done anything to address thermal runaway concerns or battery fire. Uh, all we have done is eliminate the external high voltage uh, electricity within that uh, vehicle. So that's now just contained to the battery pack. If you are performing a fire investigation on an electric vehicle, you're going to have heat that's going to have compromised all of that insulation. Uh, it's potentially also compromised the bus bars that are insulated within the battery pack and all those levels of safety you can forget about. It is an extremely dangerous operation to go pulling through a high voltage battery pack um, in the best of times, let alone for a fire investigation. So it's critical to make sure you go out and get some decent training. There is some training that is uh, more focused towards uh, electric vehicle technicians. Um, so how to safely depower these processes. Um, you could have someone tell you that you can make an EV completely safe just by disconnecting the 12 volt battery. I'll tell you they're wrong. So it's important to understand what you're dealing with and how all these different systems come into play. You might also be dealing with a vehicle that's been uh, submerged in fresh water or salt water and understand how that's going to change your electrical safety through that vehicle as well. And sorry, Dan, I've just, if you go to the next slide, I've just dropped in that one. Show it. There we oh, go. Excellent. Yep. So what we see here is our uh, electrical conductor. We then have a layer of that insulation. We then have the stainless steel braid and the foil wrap. So the stainless steel braid mm -hmm. is what I was talking about earlier. That is what is uh, hooked up to the vehicle battery management system, and that will show a insulation or uh, isolation fault um, through the vehicle. Uh, we also have in the plugs uh, a low voltage circuit. So if someone was to inadvertently um, go to disconnect a plug, the vehicle should also, in those circumstances, isolate the high voltage battery. Um, so if you were to be looking for high voltage or um, DC voltage in electric vehicle, uh, emergency responders using a non-contact detector are not able to do, detect DC voltage, only AC. Uh, and in the course of your fire investigation or incident response, you may also be dealing with charging um, or other electrical infrastructure. That is where another hazard would be in needing to make sure we go through the appropriate uh, procedures to shut that down as well. So you'll see here uh, what we're doing is some electrical contact testing and dealing with the electrical hazard in two ways. First off, we're at a cell level. So the cells are only uh, say 3.7 to 4.2 volts roughly each, depending on what the chemistry is. Uh, in this particular vehicle, we're looking at um, NMC chemistry. Uh, so DC is looking to create a circuit from a positive to a negative side of that circuit. 
if we're only introducing one side, we're not able to conduct between the, the full positive and negative and have our body create that circuit. So if you were to be doing this sort of work, uh, this is what's called the one hand rule. Uh, there's also ways you can do probing with a contact detector. Uh, they might call it chopsticks. So you're holding both the positive and the negative contact uh, of your uh, voltmeter or multimeter in one hand to do that probing as well. Um, the only way to check for a voltage in that situation would be with a contact type detector rather than non-contact. You may be able to use a clamp type meter. Um, just being aware, although we are dealing with thousands of burnt out cells, uh, you may be dealing with a vehicle that, as we showed earlier, does not involve thermal runaway. You could potentially have full 400, 500, 600 volts. A Porsche Taycan runs at 800 volts. Some mining equipment is at 1,000 volts. So if you've assumed you've had a burnt out battery pack, um, but you don't actually have a battery pack involvement at all, you may have that uh, high voltage that is there with all of this cabling, insulation, and bus bars that have been uh, fully compromised and all of that insulation has been burnt through. So we had a um, hell of a time going through this vehicle. Uh, you can see uh, there's a magnet-based torch attached and I'm going through the vehicle, pulling out all of the waste that was picked up off the road and shoveled into the vehicle. So although um, most of these cells were burnt out, not all of them actually were. Uh, I've got around about three cells at least that are still recording around about 3.9 or 4 volts. So a fully charged uh, lithium-ion battery that we see has been exposed to a fire event. Consider that like a grenade with a pin pulled. It's just waiting to go off. If we've put that into this car to dispose of it, we're really expecting that car to have a secondary ignition event and potentially you've just got rid of a crime scene or a coronial inquest or something like that as well. What we want to do, rather than putting that uh, battery cell waste back into the vehicle, uh, into a, uh, a plastic uh, hazmat drum or um, what we were using was the wheelie bins, uh, we had one that was half full of water for any of the cells that we found that were still either uh, fully intact or we were concerned about and then we had the, the standard waste bin uh, for all the other waste. So the only battery cell that you can treat as being safe is one that has burnt out and has obviously burnt out. If you even had a multimeter and you're looking on the, the battery from uh, the positive is just the top and then any part of the casing is a negative, um, even if you do not see a voltage there, the way that the battery has been made, there's the positive, uh, so you've got a cathode and you've got an anode, and between that is a separator. The separator is an open weave plastic material. Its uh, whole process, its job, is to let the ions flow through between the, the uh, positive and the negative and not let those two parts touch. If that battery has been exposed to excessive heat, instead of being an open weave, that separator membrane becomes a solid mass and stops that ion flow and you'll have a battery that shows zero voltage. That battery could be fully charged and it has been compromised by a fire. You need to treat that as a fire hazard. It could be uh, an explosive risk if you're dealing with that, picking it up off the ground to see what's going on. Um, these are dangerous events where they have been damaged. We do have cases of fire investigators, one in the States that was doing exactly that, picked up a cell to have a look at it, and it went off in his face. He was hospitalized. His partner was worried that the uh, fire investigator that got injured had just died. It was a, a serious event. So treat them with utmost respect, please. We've got a um, few more slides on that in a sec, Dan, actually, just, uh, yep. So what we're looking at here is a cell that has fully ruptured that there is no further a fire risk or anything else does still have the uh, electrolyte over the battery as well so make sure you're using suitable gloves so secondary ignition hazards um, this is going to play out where you may be called to investigate an incident a day later or a week later or a month later 
We do have events where vehicles have been moved around by forklifts in uh, salvage yards or exposed to the weather, and we have seen secondary uh, events, secondary ignition. Um, our record at the moment, um, unfortunately, we can't open up the chat, but who wants to have a bit of a stab in the dark? Go, oh, what, two days, three days, five days? Mr. Forbes, we want to have a guess. Pick a number. How long do you think secondary ignition? 10 days? 68 days. So that was a vehicle that was a um, uh, crash test. They ended up having a coolant leak within the battery pack. So majority of battery vehicles, the battery cells within the packs are cooled by some form of glycol-based coolant. Um, where you have had an impact, it is quite possible to have that um, coolant leak through the battery pack and introduce some shorts. If that has been um, uncontrolled and that coolant leak continues, um, 68 days later, this crash site uh, found that they came in one morning and there's a vehicle in there racking uh, with a battery fire. So 68 days later. So just be aware of those sorts of things as well. Or it might be it's been picked up and shifted around the um, the the storage site, um, being quarantined or whatever it might be, but then it's been treated a bit rough or as the body has been twisted coming and going off of a uh, tow truck, those sorts of things, all those opportunities end up adding, uh, increasing your secondary ignition risk. And um, sorry, sorry, Dan, if I can just jump in there. The yes. uh, our, our data indicates that secondary ignition occurs about ten in about ten percent of cases. So, it's um it, you know it's a, it's a significant risk, and as Dan points out, particularly if we've got a vehicle like like Tesla, where you've had uh, you know impact, the battery's been torn open. We've then potentially had water ingress into the pack during the firefight. Then it's been towed around that kind of thing. Obviously, we didn't see a secondary ignition, but um you know we kind of have these you know, uh, you know, kind of risk factor after risk factor after risk factor. So secondary ignition is, um, as Dan says, um, something we really need to be aware of. Um, I've got a question in here from Steve Attard. I'm just going to go back a few slides for the high voltage electrocution hazard. So what we have Which in is... an EV. Oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, I'll talk to this because I'm sure everyone's going to be interested in it. We have our low voltage system and we have our high voltage system. The low voltage system is the same as pretty much any other vehicle that's out there. We have a positive cable that may run out to a sensor or our headlight, um, our door switch, windows, whatever it might be. And the chassis or the body um, creates the negative path back from the, the sensor back through the body to the negative side of the battery. So if we were to conduct ourselves between the positive terminal and any part of the vehicle, we would be creating a negative circuit of 12 volts or whatever that vehicle was running at. The high voltage side though, is completely independent of that. It does not reference the vehicle for ground or earth. It does not contact the vehicle body or chassis anywhere through the vehicle. If it does, and if it senses that, it should automatically open the high voltage sensors. So where we have one of these cables here, we would always actually have two. We'd have a positive and a negative, um, running through any part of that vehicle. Where we are running DC motors, you may have more cables because they're running three phase kind of systems, not just a straight positive and a negative. Hopefully that answers the question for you there, Steve. Um, sorry, let's flip forward back to where we were. So stranded energy. Here's one I prepared earlier. So we are looking at a battery pack out of a scooter. You saw a reference zero voltage. And I'm going through cells here that look pretty screwed up. I still have nearly 3.7 volts. Show me that that cell there is still live and still is a thermal runaway potential hazard. I'm pretty safe with this pack because I know it. It spent three months submerged in fresh water at my house. Uh, prior to me going through and doing any of this testing. It's a situation where 68 days is that potential. Um, if we can cool that down and we don't see an event for 
let's say two weeks, we'd be pretty confident we're going to be safe. But 68 days is that kind of record we've had so far. Um, so this one was in water for three months. Um, through the battery management system, I had zero voltage showing. However, I still had um, cells that were live in this pack. It could have potentially gone up at any stage. So um, this is the uh, situation I was talking about previously. So back in 2022, um, do we have any more on this, Emma, to go with it? Uh, no, sorry, just uh, there weren't many images. Yeah, OK. So uh, fire investigators have been out at this site for uh, investigating after an e-scooter in a property. They've been rifling through and an investigator has picked up a cell. Um, I actually don't have any cells with me at the moment, um, but Emma does. Emma's going to demonstrate how to correctly hold a damaged or problem cell compared to on the end. If you're holding it on the end, consider you got your finger over the end of a loaded gun and that could potentially go off without any warning. So that is a blast cap in the top. Hold to the side. Thank you very much, Emma. Sorry, I thought I was going to get that wrong. Gets hold off then, actually. <laughs> <laughs> top marks. Excellent. Um, so just be aware of that. Consider it a, a hand grenade with a pin pulled. You just don't know how long it's going to take for that to detonate. Emma's and found sorry, the photo. I, I just dropped it in for Proby. <laughs> Good job. Thank so, you, Emma. So, <laughs> pleasure. So two parts here. So Emma, can you hold up my base plate, please? Sure. So Ugh. what we have here is the melted remains of the base of the battery pack that is designed to be sacrificial in the case of a thermal runaway. So emergency responders can access that battery pack, get water into those cells, that event can be not necessarily contained to the pack. It's a really difficult uh, extinguishment challenge for uh, responders to put out a thermal runaway fire, uh, lithium ion battery fire in an EV, because we've got the modules, sorry, cells make a module, modules make a pack, that's all underneath that vehicle. Um, so with the Tesla Model um, 3 and Model Y, uh, we're seeing them with this melted um, base plate. What you're seeing here in the hand is actually that base plate where it's been torn away by that tail shaft from the truck. So we have part there where it's been melted, part there where it's actually been torn out. David, so there we go. Sorry, Proby, did Proby want to, did you want to mention something about that as well, Proby? No, the only thing I would say to him, if, if you've got 30 seconds while we're taking some questions, if you can find the photo where that whole unit is at the at the end point of its path of trajectory, that would be great, just to give Roger a bit that. of an example. All right. We'll, we'll say thanks very much for having us and we'll take any questions. If Mick, I don't know how much time we've got left, but happy to take questions and I'll go and find a find a photo. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we've got still got plenty of time. I know we said about seven, but I'm sure people are still uh, quite very interested. Um, no, listen, thanks. That's... Um, well, that's the first time I've I've seen a fire investigation into an uh, EV, and um, I, uh, yeah, it was really really interesting. I think the points, and I'm glad you covered it, um, that are really important for us and relevant is the is the safety. Um, so yeah, that, that that's that's really good. To to reiterate that, Dan, can we just go over it again? Your top tips for investigating an EV um, safety wise. So. I think it was, um, or even Glenn, I think, um, definitely PPE, high voltage gloves, um, um, masks. Anything else did you say? Or uh, I'd go beyond that as well for firefighter, oh, sorry, for fire investigators is to make sure they're, they're following the same guidance as for firefighters, the whole golden shower within the hour. Yes. Uh, we had a heck of a mess through this workshop and we probably spent – um, do you have the time lapse as well, Emma? That's quite cool to have a squeeze out if you have it. Um, uh, let's say six hours pulling this battery pack out of this vehicle. Um, so that's in a Tesla workshop with two of the lead Tesla um, employees in this sort of field um, and four of us helping to do bits and pieces. 
we probably spent another an hour cleaning the, the workshop back up after this. So we had fine dust through a lot of the space. Um, straight after that, shower up, clean up, decontaminate, um, be aware of your surroundings and what you, you're exposing yourselves to. So yeah. Michael, can I just yes. can I just jump in? I just I want to share something from a personal experience. So sure. the Tesla the Tesla technicians we have with us, one of them is in charge of the Asia Pacific region. When we had this opportunity, we were all really keen. We were eager. We didn't expect it would take us the entire day, but we did it methodically as everybody does a fire investigation. And at the end of the day, I said to him, I said, you know, this is a wonderful experience and this is the, exactly the sort of thing that we need to get information to people about. And he said, there are senior technicians at Tesla in the US that have been with Tesla since its inception that have not been able to do what the six of us did. And in fact, the six of us are the first six in the world to have done what we did. And that's what yeah. derived this presentation. So we're, in a, we're in, a, in a very small group and it's not often you get the opportunity. So I would say thank you to Tesla for donating the vehicle for us to be able to do what we did because mm -hmm. post what we did on the Sunday, it that went out and formed some multi-agency training mm. in Victoria for emergency responders where this learning could be passed on face to face and opportunities like this you need to take. So props to Emma and Dan for being able to facilitate the portions of that that they did, but a massive thank you to Tesla for the assistance that they gave us. It is really nice to be involved in something that is as niche as this and be able to share the learnings with as many people as we can yeah and yeah i, I must admit that the tesla contact i have um, is always open and um, provide information and has been wonderful um, he's actually done we've done an education night with him uh, a few years ago pre-covid uh, with the tesla vehicles out at the, at the esa so um, they've been they've been brilliant in my dealings uh, with them as well and listen thanks to to you for, for sh sharing that with us, I guess New South Wales AFI is, is the first uh, organisation to uh, have a look at how a, um, a Tesla battery is uh, investigated and slowly um, pulled apart to to really uh, get to the, the uh, crust of uh, the failure event, uh, which is which is great. So uh, thank you. I think um, Ben's going to um, ask people if you've got questions, just to raise your hand now. Um, uh, my question I did have is for Emma, whoever, um, if, if I say, is how do you how do you how do you get your data? I know you said you had a data researcher, uh, person that's getting your data, but um, I'd imagine that um, uh, all the events around the world, uh, trying to manage that and trying to get the information, must take uh, a lot of cunning and, and a lot of um, persistence. <laughs> uh, a lot of to get two a.m. meetings around and the world and, and verify it. How, how do you do it? Uh, yeah, it's tricky. Um, we we've uh, we've become excellent as a team. As I said before, we saw that as soon as we saw that video that um, that our friend you know Daniel from uh, RFS took, we we're like battery fire. We we just we can we can spot them a mile off because we've been doing it for so long. Um, so we initially started uh, basically trawling through media. Then that became. Uh, social media and and we I I hate it but I spend a lot of time on TikTok and Twitter and those kinds of places and and our researcher Kira is an absolute gun you know she's got little spies tucked in all corners of the world keeping an eye on things for her and and we have a you know the the, the verification stats are just the ones we can say yes battery fire and then we always have loads that are on our investigating list so it might just be a small clip of a video that we think looks like battery fire but we've got no other details on that so they will stay there until we can confirm or deny um more recently we've been um uh, able to kind of share data or, or we get contacted by um you know drivers or it might be the fire department we always put requests into fire departments to have a chat with them um and you know some are easier to to kind of catch than others um, and then we've just started with the Netherlands and France to data share. So we're putting data sharing agreements in place. So 
those countries or agencies that actually collect their data, they're tracking it. Um, we, you know, they put data in and, and we give them access to the database kind of thing. So um, as I said at the start, I think, you know, the, the database is very immature. I think it's another five years before it's really kind of singing and dancing uh, for, for this. And and sorry, I've just, just for Proby, um, I've just put three images after this slide. Dan, if you want to flick on quickly just to show that where the tail shaft kind of ended up and so this is this is as we followed down oh, yeah. the batch down the battery pack and yeah. if you go to the next one Dan Nathan's stronger than me so Nathan's holding the difficult bit up but when you see the piece can you just highlight with your um, mouse please Dan yes thank you so that's the melted piece of the battery tray which actually came from a little bit further down and you can see the outline meets exactly so once we worked out where it finished and we were able to remove the aluminium piece from the top of the tail shaft it was almost a perfect match so it gave us real confidence to be able to say this is where this thing absolutely stopped and, th and there's there's the last piece so that shows exactly where it sat how it ended up it melted on top and it stayed there, which was really good for us to be able to say, we now know the path of travel of this lump of metal, where it finished up and what damage it did along the way. So it was really, it was a bit of a, a, a smiley face moment for everyone when we sort of yeah, pieced it and, through to that. And part of fire investigation is the reconstruction in the excavation. And, and you do get bits of furniture, bits of the house, uh, bits of the room that have fallen or done things, and you're putting those pieces back together. And this is really, really good that even though it was before the fire, you, um, it sort of did keep its shape and you were able to reconstruct and put that back in. And that's 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 brilliant. Really well done. Thank you. Even just having it, whoever accidentally or deliberately kept that with the vehicle, that was gold for us. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, that was awesome. Bit of luck there. <laughs> the, the smoking gun, literally. Yeah, yeah. Still, still in my garage, um, stinking oh, the go. place out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, questions, raise hands of uh, if there are any questions out there. <clears throat> yes, here we go. Ben. Go, go ahead, Dom. Hey, Dominic. Uh, hi. hi, Emma. Hi, Dan. How, how you doing? doing? Hey, Dominic. How you doing? Grand, thanks. <laughs> grand. Early morning here in Ireland. Otherwise, grand. <laughs> Good morning, and, Dominic. So you're already on the Guinness then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. Um, Dan, just a question there, just on the, on the pyro fuse. Um, I kind of missed it. Is it possible you could just explain again and also with it, is that standard on every EV model? The dropout pack? No, no the, the, the pyro fuse. Oh, pyro Sorry, fuse. Pyro fuse. <laughs> Tesla is the only um, OEM that is using the pyro fuse. So, um in the threes and y's and in the refreshed s's and x's it's in the battery pack um in the earlier s's and x's i believe it's in the um fuse module um up under the the bonnet the frunk um so emma do you have a photo of that available basically it is a steel um plate uh aluminium plate sorry that's a bus bar and it has uh, pretty much the same as a SRS detonator under that. And when it is um, told to open that circuit, it blows that contact. It breaks that bus bar apart. Um, so not to be too much of a, a Tesla fanboy, but the amount of safety that goes into their cars is phenomenal. Um, we may have the cut loops as an initial response for emergency responders, either under the front, under the bonnet, as well as in the right hand rear quarter glass. So we can cut those um, cut loops. You might be looking at a different vehicle that could have a pull fuse or a pull tab. Um, or unfortunately, you may find some vehicles such as BYD with their range don't necessarily have any of those options and they will direct emergency responders. Just seeing if I'm still going, or everyone had frozen there for a second. Um, no, no, so no, yeah. the, the BYD has nothing. It is directing you to rely <laughs> on the um, uh, loss of insulation 
uh, loss of isolation, I should say, and disconnecting a high voltage cabling out of the battery pack. That is not ideal. Um, so some of the vehicles may be like a Volvo or a Polestar um, or the Nissan Leaf will direct you to a manual service disconnect. So that is a helpful tool where you can remove um, the circuit out of the battery, but be aware you are dealing directly with the high voltage of the battery. If you have contactors that have welded together, so we do have cases where that has um, been a factor in incidents, the high voltage contactors have stayed welded together. Um, if you're going for the um, manual service disconnect, you're potentially opening that live high voltage circuit. Um, not ideal if if firefighters have been spraying water around or anything like that. How are you going tonight, Bob? You there, Dan? Yes, I'm One here. One question. One question. Uh, does Amazon the ANCAP come, uh, the ANCAP safety uh, app, does that assist? in any way uh, it can definitely help you so if yeah we should definitely cover that as well you have the ancap rescue app you have the ncap euro rescue as well or if you wanted to you can go out and purchase a version which is called moditech uh, there are some other providers around specifically for evs um, so that will guide you through the uh, as emma has showed you where the battery pack is where the components are how to um, isolate these particular parts as well. And then for emergency responders, how do we uh, identify, immobilize, isolate those sorts of things as well. So our procedure that we preach is IAMS. How do we identify that it's an electric vehicle? Uh, for emergency responders, assume that it is until proven otherwise. Uh, what are we going to assess at that scene? So um, is it in drive? Are there smoking? Do you hear pops? Uh, what's our conditions? Then we're going to move through how do we um, immobilize the vehicle? Um, so in a lot of EVs for responders, it might just be opening the door, uh, pushing the park bucket button, speak to the driver if they're conscious and able to. Um, but then how do we go beyond that? How do we isolate the high voltage and monitoring with a thermal imaging camera? So uh, for a fire investigation. Platform to perform oh, sorry. Someone was also going. Played, also played a video. Um, Apologies. So as for fire investigation, you may still have thermal imaging camera to see hot spots, those sorts of things, um, or go back to your fire service that could be there in attendance. If you are still seeing temperatures that are elevated, uh, make sure the fire service remains there and treat that as a critical scene with caution. So just for everyone's knowledge, Steve Attard, a fire investigator from FRB in Victoria has just posted um, in the question and answer section a YouTube video on pyrofuse test operation. Yeah, Excellent. Thank Cheers. you. That's, that's the video I was just playing when you were talking. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well Steve. done, Steve. Love your work. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Official thank standards you. for fire extinguishing terms of flow rate and duration in Australia. Um, oh, no. I think that that's so, that's probably another that's probably a whole other conversation i think um yeah that's a different yeah. night <laughs> yeah okay all right is there any other questions uh if you can raise your hand and then i'll uh, permit your mic access um sorry just to go for one emma's mentioned it or emma, i think emma's replied to it possibly in the text so the vehicle was traveling at 111 point something kilometers an hour. The G force recorded by the vehicle was 0.2 G's when it impacted the tail shaft. So the Tesla uses an electric door to open. The driver and the passenger both use their normal door functions to open and exit the vehicle once they pulled over completely safely and stopped. Um, I believe it was five minutes later They've thought, oh, I left the shopping in the boot, went to the rear of the vehicle, opened the boot using the man, the normal electric boot function, removed their groceries from the car, have closed the boot, um, 
we have all of that data available from Tesla because this car records all of that. You may unfortunately be in a situation where the car has been completely wrecked and burnt out and destroyed and out of cellular coverage area, and then you may not have this information. So as a fire investigation trying to go through and rehash what has happened, please use these resources. It may be Tesla, it could be the SRS um, airbag module and that data, um, and go through and use that as a support as well. I've just put what? the link, sorry, the link for Tesla Legal in the uh, Q&A. So you can use that link, go to their website and officially request data from them. My question would be, uh, do you think Tesla would be so accommodating if uh, it was a battery failure? Uh, I think uh, I, I couldn't answer that question. You'll have to ask them. But I think <laughs> that uh, certainly, as, as you've you've mentioned, and and you know that they've been of all the the manufacturers we talk to, and we talk to a lot. It's only recently that other manufacturers are starting to actually reach out to us and say, "Come and have a look at this and yeah. share what we share what we know." You know, help us kind of get this message mm. out to to responders. But whereas Tesla have people dedicated just for this, so I think um, that you know, I, I I know that not everyone likes the the supreme leader and and you know, <laughs> Twitter's gone a bit weird. But um, uh, but I think that in terms of assisting with new technology in this way that they they simply that you know they, they've been the best at this so I, I don't think they're really going to shy away from much i agree that you can't knock um the assistance they've provided today so it's been great right. yeah that's especially it. from our side as well oh there we go yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was that was Tesla before she was in about a million pieces. Uh, we we let CFA and FRV and uh, a few others kind of loose on on the cutting tools, and uh, yeah, she's she's looking a little sadder than that these days. <laughs> uh, Great. Any other questions? Everyone's happy. Ah, right. There you go. Well, listen. Um, thank you. Team EV Fire Safe, uh, Dan, Emma, and Proby, they like to call you. <laughs> um, uh, listen, it's been really, really good. Obviously, fascinating and um, sort of groundbreaking for us in terms of how to do it. Um, hopefully, it gives us some more tips. And certainly, um, people that are looking at this, uh, you know, safety hopefully is in the front of their mind when they're sort of conducting these type of investigations. Uh, mm. Let's hope that there's not too many of them out there, but uh, I can see that. Um, you know, for whatever reason, um, these fires are going to increase. So mm -hmm. the awareness of them is going to be very important for uh, all concerned and hence why we're in, in, uh, in, interested in it as well. And we're going to do a bit of a plug um, that we have got an up, up, our upcoming uh, conference, biannual conference for the Australasian Association of Fire Investigators. Uh, it's going to be in Western Sydney in October. Uh, there is going to be a focus on lithium-ion batteries and uh, electric vehicles and all things lithium-ion batteries and fire investigation, plus aside uh, also wildfires. We're going to look at that as well. We're going to have one day live uh, burns uh, and sort of a field trip for one day and then a two-day conference uh, in October. So uh, keep an eye out for that. You can certainly scan that to get uh, on our mailing list. That's going to be the website. It's not live just yet, but you can certainly uh, should be live in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got an organising committee getting that ready together and hopefully maybe EV Safe will be involved as well. So that'd be great to see. Thanks for tonight. Uh, thank you all for attending. It's been a record night for uh, New South Wales AFI. Uh, over 140 people online. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a big up on our YouTube site and then in the coming days, share it all with your friends. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. See you soon. <clears throat>